Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, I'm talking with our optical experts, Roger and Aaron, about MTF testing. If you're unfamiliar, MTF testing is the method by which we and many manufacturers determine how sharp lenses are. There are a lot of misconceptions out there around what MTF testing can accomplish, how the results should be represented, and how important any of it is. Even the definition of the word sharp is kind of up for debate. To clear some of that up, I thought I'd sit down with Roger and Aaron to talk through MTF from the perspective of a complete beginner. Roger, Aaron, thank you for joining me. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Good to be here. Hi there. I want to start here by admitting that I'm probably the most out of my depth that I've ever been on this show, which is saying something. I'm often talking about stuff that I totally don't understand. Uh, And today is no exception. We're talking about MTF charts and testing, which is, we'll say, not my area of expertise. So I hope both listeners and guests, you can forgive me if I ask any stupid questions. I, I think that's perfect because most people don't understand MTF. Great. I won't be alone then. Uh, And I I guess we can start by just explaining in the most basic terms you can what MTF means. Uh, What does the acronym stand for? I guess we'll start there. Uh, Modulation transfer function. That should clear it all up for everybody. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I'm glad we got that sorted. It's called modulation transfer function. And thank you for joining us. (laughs) Basically, it's what we're measuring is the contrast between light and dark bars. And toward what end? Yeah, and I think logically everyone understands that if you take a picture of a bunch of black and gray lines, there's a little bit of blurring. What might be 100% black and 100% white in real life, if you take a picture of it, there's going to be a little area where it's not 100%. And MTF is measuring how much of that area is blurry and to what degree. So you do it by contrast. So, for example, the contrast between black and white is 100%. If right on the edge, the contrast drops, then your MTF might be 0.7 or 0.4 if it was really blurry. So that's what we're measuring. And then the second part is what loses most people, and that's called frequency. And the frequency basically is how close are those black and white lines. So you can imagine that if my black and white lines are a foot apart, a little blurry, it's not a very big deal. If they're an inch apart and the blur is half an inch, then that's a big deal. Or if they're a millimeter apart and the blur is a half a millimeter, it's basically all gray. So that's what we're measuring by frequency. Frequency being higher means the lines are closer together, means that is fine detail. And correct me if I'm wrong, that frequency is measured in line pairs per millimeter? In the MTF machine. If someone's using IMATEST, they sometimes measure it in line pairs per image height. Uh, Because that gives you a bigger number and looks cooler. Uh, But that basically is the image heights 24 millimeters times the line pairs per millimeter. I think a lot of what makes this difficult to understand, both MTF testing and lens testing in general, is that a lot of these terms are used in sort of a subjective way. Like when we use this term sharpness, that can mean different things to different people. Some of which they've made up. Right, exactly. And I I think in some cases, people are using the terms sharpness and resolution interchangeably or sharpness and contrast interchangeably. Very much. So at least for the purposes of the tests that we perform, could you explain what we mean by the terms sharpness, resolution and contrast? Well, I, I think we try really hard not to use the term sharpness because it's really not defined. Oh, okay. So that's one of those subjective aesthetic terms. But but we do anyway. Uh, we screw up sometimes and say sharpness. <laughs> um, usually for us, we're talking about resolution. And that is basically how fine of detail the lens and camera can, re- can resolve. Now, we're testing just the lens. If we were using, say, Imatest or one of the um, computer analysis programs, we'd be testing the combination of the camera and the lens. And can you explain what Imatest is? With Imatest, basically you take a very carefully regulated photograph of a chart. So to give you an example, 
I hear people going, I can square to a chart handheld, and that just makes me laugh and laugh. With Emetess, you have to be within a degree of tilt and within, say, 10 or 12 pixels of the center. And the tilt has to be in all quadrants. So when we did Emetest, it would probably take us, Aaron, what, 12 shots sometimes to line it up properly? Absolutely, because it, it also has to take into account the distortion that's there. <laughs> and so it's comparing a distorted image side to side, top to bottom, uh, corner to corner, and trying to find that you're, you're within that, that small degree of alignment. So, so basically, all that aside, that's basically then you measure those same things, black and white bars, and you decide what the MTF is. But that's the MTF of the system, the camera and the lens. So, you know, one of the things that always amuses me and someone says, well, I saw this lens test and it showed this and this other lens test showed it was much better. And I'm looking and they're done on two different cameras. So they're meaningless. You can't compare them. Because the difference in resolution could be a function of the sensor and not the lens necessarily. Correct. And even if it's the same, quote, megapixel camera, we don't know about the cover glass thickness, the micro lenses, other things, how, how things are processed. So that's not that it's not pertinent. It's very pertinent. That's what people take pictures with. But what we do after we gave up Imatest, which we, how long did we mess with Imatest, Aaron? Three years? That sounds about right. Yeah. And, and we mostly gave it up because we have to test a lot of lenses and stuff we explained earlier, Imatest is too slow. So that's why we went to the optical bench measurements. Okay. And getting into the optical bench, that is testing the lens on its own, or at least with the hardware involved in the optical bench. It's not right. dependent on a camera sensor. Yeah. Basically, the optical bench is using a microscope to look at that stuff, and it's the same microscope for every lens. Something you kind of touched on before that I want to cover early here is the difference between an aesthetic subjective good lens and a technical, scientific, maybe theoretical sharp lens. I think this comes up a lot on the blog where people think of, well, the best lens is the lens that performs best on the MTF chart when there are so many other factors that can contribute to whether a lens is good for an individual project or not. How would you explain the difference between a technically sharp lens, one that performs well in these tests, and a quote-unquote good lens, which is more of like a personal decision? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think I do. And, and I, I, I see this all the time. We're testing resolution. And I can tell you that lens A resolves better than lens B and by how much, but I can't tell you it's a better lens. Because we're not testing, okay, we're not testing, uh, we can, but we don't usually test lateral color. Uh, some people will find longitudinal color more of a big deal than others. The, sh the focusing depth, and by that I mean, uh, if you get two lenses, everybody likes to have a depth of field calculator. It's not necessarily the same. Some lenses go from sharp to out of focus in a very short focusing distance, and others take longer. So there's a lot of things that go into making the lens that is my favorite lens, one of which is resolution. And all we're measuring really is resolution. Aaron works more with cine lenses, so he may have some more to add to that. Yeah, I think when you start to judge whether something is a good lens or for us, a good copy where we've, we've taken enough measurements over, you know, a number of samples. And so we can sort of decide based on that, what the particular characteristics of, this type of lens should be, then we can pick from that grouping the ones that are the better copies that we would consider good. And so when, when you start looking at them as a group, what their capabilities are in a way, then, then you start to, you, you almost start to look for different things than say the highest resolution. You, you maybe start to look for the uh, overall balance of a lens. You know, how does something look as you rotate it? Is the top left corner of your image going to be similar looking to the bottom right? Or is there a little tilt there, a little misalignment that uh, will start to make that lens look a little funky? Yeah. And I think one thing to mention also is we talk about this in two ways. The main purpose of, of Aaron and my's life in doing this is to find bad lenses and fix them. 
if you go on the internet, the main purpose of their life is to find if the uh, Wonder Bar 650 is sharper than the Duflot 410. You can argue about it for days. So they're, they're different, different things we're doing with the same tool. So to get into the testing itself, how exactly is the test performed? Uh, from a logistical standpoint, what steps do you have to take? And from a technical standpoint, what exactly is the optical bench measuring? Aaron, you want to do this one? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I know. Basically, I'm saying explain to a moron what is happening in your office. All right. If you look at, at the optical bench, we've, we've put the lens on a very flat plate, incredibly flat. Underneath it in a box is a microscope on a camera. And above it is a big arm with a huge collimator. Collimator shoots light in a, a dot or cross that is collimated to be the same as light from infinity. So far, so good? <laughs> yes. Okay. So I push a button, and the first thing it does, after we programmed all these things in, it's all automated, It right down the middle of the lens, it measures how much that, in our case, with our bench, it's a cross, how much is that cross blurred? And it does that at all the frequencies at once. And it tells us that, boom, right here at this point, the MTF is this. Then the little collimator tilts a degree or two, depending on how wide the lens is. The camera moves over in the opposite direction a millimeter or two, and it does it again. And basically, across the lens from, say, left to right, as you'd look through it, we make 20 measurements or so every millimeter. Then the machine prints us out a pretty graph and says, here is the MTF from one side to the other of this lens at all these frequencies. And that's cool. And then the little base rotates and we do it again and again and again so that we've sliced that lens, not just from left to right, but from top to bottom and corner to corner. And that gives us a picture of how does the lens actually image in the real world. So that tells us, for example, this lens is kind of not too good on the top right corner and top left corner because it's tilted. This lens is really good in all four corners, et cetera. So to do that, it's, it's um, a process that the, the, the wider the lens is and the smaller the aperture, the longer it takes. But a wide aperture 50 millimeter lens, it can do in a minute or a couple of minutes. And a small aperture 14 millimeter lens, it may take 15 minutes. All right. I think I'm following so far. And I should mention here that even more so than our other podcast episodes, this one's going to be very dependent on you sort of knowing what these things look like. So we'll link to MTF charts in the show notes so you can take a look at those. And it really helps to see them when you're thinking about this, because they're very like evocative of the information that they're trying to display. Even if you don't necessarily know what you're reading exactly, just seeing the chart will give you kind of a basic idea of what information the chart is showing. Very much. And I think, Brian, this is probably off the record, but there's a Vimeo somewhere where we put up when we first got the bench of it actually taking a slice. Oh, perfect. Oh, that'll be on the record. I'll keep that in if we can find okay. it. Um, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll link to that in the it, show it, notes. It's just showing the machine kind of moving through each, and you can see it, take a reading, move, take a reading, move. Awesome. Yeah, we'll link to that. Hopefully that'll be a helpful visual aid. And to just kind of read this back to you and cover what we've covered so far, what you're measuring is resolution, not sharpness, but resolution. And that's not resolution in the way that we think of like a sensor resolution. It's the ability of the lens right. to resolve detail, specifically black and white lines. And you're measuring that resolution at different frequencies, those frequencies being different line pairs per millimeter. So progressively smaller and more tightly packed black and white lines. And you're taking that measurement from the center of the lens out because the ability of a lens to resolve those fine lines is often not consistent between the center and the corners. Often lenses are much less, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it cause I can't avoid it. Sharp, <laughs> <laughs> less sharp on the edges than in the center. Well, scientifically we say they suck on the edges, but you can use it. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll use that term instead. The, the preferred scientific nomenclature. 
So that test is done in slices. We'll say if, if you're if you're picturing the lens like a pie, you're taking four slices out and doing that uh, centered edge test at four different quadrants of the lens. My next question then is, are the results from each slice relatively similar? Are the numbers from quadrant to quadrant pretty consistent? In theory, they're supposed to be, lenses are supposed to be, supposed, I should say that properly, to be the same in every quadrant. In reality, no. And it depends on the lens. And by lens, I mean the type of lens. So, you know, brand X, 35 millimeter F1.4. It also varies by copy to copy. So, for example, there are some lenses, and I'm 35 is one that comes to mind, where one brand, we never found a lens, not one of them, that had equal corners. Never. And we tested 100. Other brands, eh, they're pretty good. There's always a little variation, but maybe 10 or 20%, nothing major. But we're using that in-house to identify the bad copy. So if we know that, you know, say, we expect a 10% variation from corner to corner in this lens and we test one and it's 30% different, then we've got a bad copy that needs optical adjustment. And Aaron, when the test does reveal inconsistencies or problems, what is the process like for adjusting the lens to compensate for that? We first need to decide whether it's abnormal enough. We know there's going to be some variation. We know that they're not going to be perfect. And so we, we have to define those expectations first. So we, we need enough copies to, to feel comfortable that we've done that. So once we feel like we have a standard, then it's, it's a matter of finding those outliers and looking at their history, seeing, seeing if we have any clues that, that might lead us to believe that it was dropped or that if it's been opened up to clean, you know, clean some dust or something like that before, where, how did we access that? Maybe we didn't put something back right. There's all sorts of things that could happen over the life of that lens that can give us some idea of where to start. But a lot of the time, you're just sort of left with the tools you have, regardless of what the history was. That lens barrel is that lens barrel. You're, you're not going to reshape it to fix a lot of things. That, that are optically apparent. Most of the time what you have are uh, certain elements that simply shift within the barrel. So if you, if you imagine just setting a disc on top of a barrel, you know, and, and that disc is able to slide back and forth, uh, that's essentially what we're doing. These things are held to the barrel with screws. So uh, that, that can be the source of the problem. Obviously, certain screws could come loose and the, the element shifts slightly to one side or the other and it's misaligned. Uh, so you're, you're left looking for things like that or just simply accessing those particular adjustable elements uh, and shifting those back into a position that gives you the right results. Others are held within the barrel. A lot of people will have seen this in our teardowns and things like that. Uh, and they, they have collars that, that hold them in place from the sides. And those collars have a, an eccentric shape to them so that they're uh, thicker on one side than the other. They're not perfectly circular. So as you rotate it, it actually pushes the element one direction or the other. And so you have adjustments like that that you can make as well. And oftentimes you have one set that will shift the lens side to side, uh, which we, we typically just refer to as centering. And then you'll have another set that actually tips the lens. So it actually moves one side uh, up or down or in or out depending on your, your orientation. And so we're tilting that element and that's uh, another adjustment that we'll be making. Uh, and it's usually a combination. Even a, even a routine adjustment often takes, you know, a couple of hours or several hours or even half a day. It's not unusual. So a lot of times I hear people go, well, can you adjust this for me? And my first response is, you have no idea what this would cost. Okay, we'll take a quick break right there. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about how we use MTF data to develop our internal standards.
Want a discount on your next order from Lens Rentals? Head to lensrentals.com slash podcast or follow the link in the show notes for a coupon code. As the largest online photo and video equipment rental house in the world, Lens Rentals has been supplying both professionals and hobbyists for over 15 years. We carry everything from cameras and lenses to drones, computers, even VR headsets, all shipped straight to your door for whatever length of time you need. Rent the gear you need to get the shot and grab a discount at lensrentals.com slash podcast. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lens Rentals podcast. Uh, before the break, we were talking about how we use MTF data to develop our internal standards for testing lenses. And that raises another question, which is how do we decide what is an acceptable level of variance? You know, it, it, if we're testing 24 to 70s all day. We can't necessarily say if this is off by even a little bit, we have to go in and adjust it. That's an unrealistic expectation, but we also can't just send them through as long as you can see through them. Uh, so there has to be some standard and I imagine that standard varies between manufacturers and from lens to lens. How do we decide what needs to be adjusted and what doesn't? Well, that's why one of the first things we do is, is test a set, usually 10, sometimes it's a few more to get standards. So we've done 10 and this is the range we expect. And then in the future, our routine testing, the lens is put on a different MTF machine in the other building. They're testing it and that machine just says it's within the range or it's not. Okay. And that range will vary depending on the manufacturer, depending on the particular lens. And, and like you said, zoom, first of all, all zooms have a much lower standard than any prime. Perfect. That brings me right to my next question. So you mentioned we do this test 10 times per lens to just get an idea of what the range of acceptable variance is going to be for zoom lenses. At what focal lengths do we do the test? Usually at both extremes and in the center. Now the center of the zoom range is not often the center of calculation, like 70 to 200. It's not always 135. Because that's an exponential difference, not a linear difference. Right. It's 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 what kind of where the barrel is halfway zoomed. But, but at three focal lengths for a zoom. And I've I don't recall ever seeing any zoom that was perfect at all focal lengths. Do you, Aaron? No. How long does one lens test typically take? So so uh, time wise for a long Focal length, wide aperture lens, like an 85.14 or 135.18 or something like that, it could be a minute or so. For a wide angle, small aperture lens, like say 16 millimeter f2.8, it can be 10, 12, 15 minutes. That brings up a good question that I forgot to ask, which is, do we test these wide open? Yes. And that's just because an open aperture can reveal more flaws? It, if There are a lot of problems with lenses. Remember, our main goal here is to find problem lenses and get them out of the fleet. But a lot of problems that show up at wide aperture are masked if you test it at f5.6 or f8. And obviously, the degree of variance can uh, vary, for lack of a better word, between manufacturers and between different lenses in a line, depending on whether it's a zoom or a prime, etc., uh, but what is typical, would you say? What is a normal degree of variance from copy to copy? L let's limit it to primes because zooms, it's going to be worse. All right. Aaron, would you say 10% variation in MTF is, is reason? And it's location too. It, it is, in the, yeah. it, in the center, maybe for a good lens, 2 or 3%, but the edges, 10%, would you think, yeah. or more? It, that sounds, I mean, that's that's reasonable for sure. Yeah, and it's a guess. We don't have a formula that says this is this is what we expect for lens x but our standards will differ um I'm, we're not naming names but if i test a 300 dollars prime and a 2500 hundred dollar prime chances are that they're going to have very different standards of what we find acceptable i want to get to now the part of this i think i understand the least so get ready for that uh when you look at these mtf charts you'll see the degree of resolution indicated twice, once by a solid line and once by a dotted line. And if you remember that resolution basically boils down to the lens's ability to show detail between black and white lines, 
The reason that there are two lines on this chart is that we measure those lines in two different orientations. Those are tangential and sagittal lines. Am I, first of all, pronouncing that right? You got it. Okay. And why do we perform the test with both tangential and sagittal lines? Oh, because they're different. Can we move along now? (laughs) (laughs) And that is a pretty simple explanation. I'll give you that. Do you want me to go into a little more detail then? Or Aaron, do you want to do this? (laughs) You want me to do that too? It's a really difficult one to explain. Let me me try this. Okay. Let's say I take a picture of a wagon wheel. The hub is the center of my image. The spokes are sagittal lines. The wheel, the circle, are tangential lines at every place that they cross. Most people don't grasp this, but they are not of the same sharpness. So you may have very sharp spokes and a slightly blurry wheel or vice versa. And that's just to do with laws of optics. Most of the time, it's actually that they're focusing slightly different. And I might be able to focus to get sharp spokes in one image and then change my focus a tiny bit and get sharp wheel with blurry spokes in the next. That is astigmatism. So one of the keys with different sagittal and tangential lines is that lens is likely to show astigmatism. And people don't think about the fact that it's different, but it is. And while we don't often take pictures of wagon wheels, we do take pictures where some things are following those sagittal lines and others are following the tangential lines. And If they're astigmatic, those will be different. You can take a picture of a, say, bush without leaves where the little branches are going different directions. If you look carefully, you'll note that certain branches are sharper than others because they are sagittal or tangential with some lenses. Okay, I think I understand this. So if you think of this as a photograph rather than radial lines around a lens, so rather than circles, a rectangle, again, the resolution test being a bunch of black and white lines next to each other, the trait that we're testing is how much the black bleeds into the white. So in some cases... That trait, the degree to which the color black bleeds into the color white, will be different depending on whether the lines are vertical relative to the lens or horizontal relative to the lens. In some lenses, yes. And the other part of that that becomes interesting is you may not notice it right in the area of focus where you're looking at your sharpness. But, you know, I said earlier, if if there's astigmatism, you may find that you're in focus in one area. And then if you move your focus forward, now you're in focus the other way. What that can really affect is the out of focus highlights. So you may be going, well, I took this picture and the out of focus highlights with this lens are gorgeous. And Joe takes a picture and goes, no, they're not. They're kind of iffy and kind of busy. And it's because he was at a different degree of out of focus and the astigmatism was showing some in focus, some out, and it's out of focus highlights. So we've been doing this for a while with a few different methods. How has our testing improved over time? Whew. Well, for one thing, and it's it's not so much the testing methods, with every kind of test, we got better at it. Aaron, how long do you think it took for us to learn how to use Emma test? Six months, eight months? Yeah, it'd be just a lot of that has to do with how long of a process it is. You know, it's a slow learning process because it takes so long to set up and then realize what you did wrong. Yeah. And we've used lens projectors. We, of course, have lots of different test charts we take photos of. Um, We bought the optical bench and we got some good results within a year or so, but we're so much better with it now than we were, say, after we got it. So, and part of that was we brought in a number of optical graduate student interns largely to show us how to do it better and to help write uh, protocols and things for it. So I'd I'd say we steadily improve for at least three or four years. Would you agree, Aaron? Yeah. The the more ways we we found to look at the MTF results, uh, the the more we learned from it and the more we could discuss, especially with our optical engineer friends. This is also kind of a lost field. Um, When we got involved, even the optical companies, the manufacturers of lenses, were doing the same tests they'd done in the 60s. 
And they didn't care because if you do better tests, you find more problems and what manufacturer wants to find more problems. So that's all changed, but this, this was largely secretive and a lost art and uh, we had to learn it all from scratch. So it took us some years. So one of the advantages of this testing method being the near instant charts, uh, let's talk about how to read these charts a little bit. And again, this is going to be pretty dependent on our listeners having seen these things. So we'll, we'll link to these in the show notes so you can take a look. And Roger, this may be too broad a question, but how do you recommend people read these charts? What information can be gleaned from this and what can't? My first recommendation is you look at the frequencies, which many people don't do. And for our charts right now, we're publishing, there'll be five different color graphs, one above the other, and they're 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 line pairs per millimeter. 10 line pairs per millimeter is large objects. 50 line pairs per millimeter is fine detail. And a really high resolution camera, say a 40 megapixel camera, that 50 and 40 line pairs per millimeter is what you're going to be able to see. Whereas if I'm shooting 4K video, well, the 20 and 30 line pairs are more important. So that's the first thing. Unfortunately, because 10 line pairs comes at the top, people tend to compare that to other lenses or between lenses and go, this is sharper. And that's really not the case. 10 line pairs would be, you know, a four megapixel camera or something. Okay. So that's first. Second, remember that the center of the MTF chart is the center of your lens going to each edge off to the sides. If it's the full MTF, or if you see the more common ones, the center is on the left and the average of the ends of edges is on the right. So that's why they're curving down. So at a glance, you can go, wow, this center is really sharp, but the edges are really not or vice versa. They're all pretty good or whatever. And you don't have to look at the numbers for that. You just kind of glance at it and go, okay, this one falls off a cliff halfway to the edge. And I actually look at these and go, this lens will be good in the center half of the image. This one may be good almost to the edge. This one is only good at the very center. So that's a quick and easy glance to make. So those are two things I'm looking at, the frequency and how does it fall off away from center. And then I look at how sharp is it in the center. And that's where you can compare between lenses fairly easily. For instance, if uh, the MTF is 0.6, that means you know the, the original chart is 1 and 0. So 0.6 is kind of iffy. At 0.3, you're getting so kind of low. If the MTF is 0.3, that's the y-axis of the MTF graph. You're getting to where you may not be able to see that detail in your photo, or it may not sharpen well. And if it's down to 0.1, basically it doesn't exist for you. So is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And that's what I meant earlier by these charts being pretty evocative of the data that they're trying to show. You don't necessarily need to know exactly what all these numbers mean to be able to figure out what it's telling you. Right. Like if you just look at one of these charts and think of it as the cross section of a lens with the far left of the chart being the center and the far right being the edge, it's pretty easy to see where that resolution fall off starts without necessarily knowing exactly what the numbers are referring to. And the, the one other thing we I didn't mention that I should have you mentioned earlier, if the dotted line and the solid line of the same color are far apart, then you have a lot of astigmatism. If they're close together, you don't. Right, exactly. And the MTF chart I'm looking at while I'm talking to you about this is the MTF for the Canon 70-200 F2.8 IS2, just to be really specific about what we're discussing. And the dotted and solid lines are very far apart, especially at the edges, especially at higher frequencies, right. which is a good indicator of astigmatism. Exactly. And in a lot of cases, maybe that's not a big deal, especially at those higher frequencies. But if I'm, say, an astrophotographer. It's a killer for an astrophotographer, but most people using a 7200 are doing sports, action, maybe wildlife and the center is all they care about or portraits. Yeah. And I, I think that's a great example of how this kind of information can be helpful for people just looking for lenses rather than like repairing lenses. 
is that it's not a be all end all. This is a good lens or this is a bad lens. It's looking at these characteristics to determine what sort of lens works for you. Yeah. The, the, the real question is what am I going to use this lens for? And does the MTF chart show that it'll be good for that? Because if I'm doing action sports with a 7200, I really don't care if the MTF in the outer one third shows a lot of astigmatism. In fact, I might like it. I want that all blurry and messy anyway. I want my action figure sharpen them. I really think we got to a good place here. I don't think I could have started this episode by reading an MTF chart and getting any helpful information out of it. But now I feel like I kind of get it. Like, I'm not going to come over there and join the repair department anytime soon, but I feel like I have a basic understanding, and that's really helpful. I, I can't imagine it was super easy to explain all this to a lay person. No, I like doing this because I think people get intimidated by these charts, and you don't have to be an MTF rocket scientist to get benefit from them. A glance at it tells you a lot. What's next for internal testing? Do you have any goals for this technology in the future? Well, honestly, our biggest thing right now, of course, everybody kind of is rocked after, you know, spending a year going, are we going to still be here in a year because of COVID? And then this year going, are we be able to get enough people to work so we can stay here? But with all that, we are not capable of testing RF or Z lenses at this point. So that's my goal is to be able to test those. And that's just dependent on what lens mounts are available for the bench? Well, we have to have them made. They're all custom made and a lens mount costs us somewhere around 10 grand. Oh, well, we've got that. I'm sure we can make that happen soon. Exactly. Aaron, what do you want to do? Well, for me, when when we get to this point in the conversation and, and we feel like people are starting to understand what that MTF graph is, it, it just leads me to question, okay, what is it about the MTF that it's not showing us? Because uh, as we've already pointed out, even though we may have a low MTF off axis, you know, as it drops to the edge of the image, uh, that doesn't mean bad lens. That's just some kind of measurement of what would be considered part of that lens's look. Like field curvature. Right. It's field curvature if you take a Cook lens, right? That's mm -hmm. very, very familiar as far as the results people get. People can pick them out very easily. It has that look. And if you looked at the MTF, it would be very balanced. I'll say that much. They're very, very clean as far as when you do a rotation, edges look very similar to each other. But if you're comparing it to other lenses, they may look a little low. But it doesn't mean that they're bad. It's just some kind of representation of that look. How they achieved that look, they weren't going for a high resolution. So what I'm looking to do is to try to find ways to find that within the MTF results, either by defocusing, because when we take these measurements, we're finding that graph that we show by focusing best in center and then leaving it there to get the rest of the measurements. Well, what if you focused the center, but then slightly defocused it to give yourself a different place within the depth of field and how do things look there? How does it change off axis when you defocus? And does that tell us something more about the look? What's happening there off axis? That's something we could do. It's easy. It's just time consuming. And then there's anamorphic lenses, which we won't go into. Oh my God, no, please. Oh yeah. I didn't even really think about how difficult it would be to test anamorphics. Well, I will tell you, Aaron's doing some really cool stuff with anamorphics uh, <laughs> using the I, MTF I wouldn't bench. say that. It's pretty I cool. questions. Uh, well, but it's it's an interesting idea. He takes the anamorphic element off and then uses the bench to adjust the standard elements behind it. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's smart. Well, it's one of those things that you go, I wish I'd thought of that because it's brilliant, but it's simple. Deconstructing things. That's yep. all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we'll 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 do a whole episode on anamorphics one of these days. I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions out there and we get a lot of questions about it. So maybe we'll have to do a whole episode and bring you guys in. Yeah, I want, I want you to do that because I won't have to be here for that. I know nothing about animals. <laughs> we'll we'll drag you in for sure. You're going to be I'll sit involved. here and go, ooh, ah, isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah, streaks, yeah. cool, blue streaks. <laughs> All right, well, thank you both for coming in. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I think this was, this was helpful. I learned a lot. Thanks, Ryan. Always enjoy it. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Lunch Rentals podcast. 
If you're interested in learning more about MTF data, well, have I got a ton of blog articles for you. We'll link to some of the most relevant ones in the show notes. As always, make sure to visit lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your next order from us. And if you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Lens Rentals, and thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast, we're answering listener questions. Why did we start including UV filters in rentals? What ancient rituals do you need to perform in order to avoid card failures? And what will cameras look like in 50 years? Find out on the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast. Podcast.